The Institute of World Affairs at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee presents International Focus, a weekly discussion of the people and events behind today's global headlines. Support provided by Milwaukee Public Television and the UWM Center for International Education. Now here's your host, Rob Rasigliano. Welcome to International Focus. So when is a fish more than just the catch of the day? Our guest today has been looking into that question. Giant sturgeon once migrated through the Danube region. Now dams cut off the sturgeon's migration routes. Diking and draining of 80% of the Danube's former floodplains have removed important spawning and feeding areas, and projects to improve navigation on the lower Danube threaten to destroy some of the last sturgeon spawning areas and migration routes. But like the sometimes violent confrontations over fishing rights in our own society, the struggle to save the sturgeon touches on issues much deeper than a bowl of caviar. Here to explore the cultural implications of the battle to save this ancient fish, we're joined by Tim Ellinger, Associate Professor of Biology at UWM, who has been working with colleagues in Romania to save the iconic Danube sturgeon. Tim, welcome to National Focus. Thank you. So Tim, the obvious question is, what, how does a, a nice fish biologist from Milwaukee get caught up in s trying to save the sturgeon in the Danube region in, 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 re in Europe? Well, I, uh, I, as you mentioned, I was hired at UWM almost 20 years ago now as, as a fish ecologist. And during my time working in Wisconsin, I got involved progressively with more and more projects that are dealing with restoring damaged fish populations or species that are in danger of extinction. And uh, in 2004, I began working over in, in southeastern Europe as part of developing some projects on sustainable development and sustainable redevelopment in that area. And I began to see many of the parallels between what was going on in terms of redevelopment in this very complicated part of the world of southeastern Europe with some of the same problems that we're facing here in the United States uh, with a more developed country as opposed to a, a country that is going through progression from the, the communist era into market-based Western society. So it became a very good opportunity to look at how ecological restoration coupled with uh, social uh, reform and economic reform can be accomplished within the institutional structures that, that make all, all of that possible. Right. So, so um, it didn't initially start out as a sturgeon project, is no, what you're it, saying? No, no it didn't, uh, although I, I did go over there on somewhat of a fishing expedition <laughs> looking for, for projects to do. I began working with colleagues at Ovidius University, which is on the shores of the Black Sea, initially looking at uh, sustainable development and indicators of sustainable development along coastal zones. Uh, we in Wisconsin sometimes forget that we're really living on the coast of a freshwater sea, just like Romania is on the coast of the Black Sea. So we have an image of the of the two regions, yeah, the and, Great Lakes and, and the Black Sea. And area. it's amazing the parallel. Constanza is sort of on the, the western coast of, of the Black Sea, and, and the same with Milwaukee on the western right. coast of, of this, the Sea of Lake Michigan. Uh, and and in, in some cases, from the bio, biophysical standpoint, sort of how you interact with, with a coastal zone, there are many parallels differences of scale, of course, but in the same way you have people living along this coastal zone, people wanting to live along the coastal zone. So you have these human pressures of development exerting on the, the biophysical system. And so you have the, the issues of, of pollution, water pollution, and economic development similar between these different coastal zones. At the same time, you have some very different issues as well, whereas we here in Wisconsin have watersheds that are, are, are bridging two countries, the United States and Canada, there in southeastern Europe you're looking at the Danube River which is the most international of rivers in the world where you have 20 countries within that basin stretching across from the Ukraine and Romania and Moldova up through the Balkans of Serbia and up into Hungary and Slovakia and Czech Republic all the way up to Switzerland, Germany, Austria. It's a, it's a very complicated system from the standpoint of, of, of languages, from the standpoint of culture, from the standpoint of economics and political systems which then influences the way that people relate to the way people view and perceive the environment. And, and from the standpoint of the work that I'm doing there now, how do you integrate across the social systems? How do you integrate across the institutional systems 
to deal with a very complicated biological and ecological problem. So are there, there are these um, much more familiar issues both here and in, in Southeastern Europe around economic development, sustainability, revitalization of a region. You know, we talk about the, the, the Rust Belt making this transformation and there we, we're looking at the transition of states from the former communist uh, Soviet Union sphere of influence to, to a more modern market mm -hmm. type economy. So it seems like the, while Sturgeon may be the, the front line here, the, the issues are much much deeper yeah. than that. Yeah, and, and what, what's, what's interesting, and, and one of the reasons why I think this is a, a good project both for, for operationalizing sustainability, how do we make it happen, it's also a very good system for us to, to study and learn about how, how to, to make sustainability happen. Um, and in this regard, species like the sturgeon. Let, let's talk about sturgeon. Why are they important to well, this? Well, that's the question is, yeah, yeah. Well, why sturgeon? Yeah, well, you, you look at, at Romania, and Romania at the mouth of, of the Danube River, there were six species of sturgeon in the Danube River. Some of the very large species, like the beluga sturgeon, which you, you had up there originally. This beluga sturgeon can grow up to be eight you know, feet long. It can be a, a monstrously long fish, grow up to be 200, 300 kilos. And it would migrate. It's, it's a fish-eating sturgeon. And it would migrate the long distances all the way up the Danube, over 800 kilometers up and down through the Danube River. And we got a better image of that. That yeah. highlights that long trip up the Danube. Right, right. And it was sort of the top predator, the, the sort of the king of the sturgeons that, uh, that existed in the river. And its legacy goes back hundreds, if not thousands of years in, in human culture, but back millions of years, sort of in geological time. And you can look up and down the Danube archaeologically and you can find cultures that, that literally grew up, you know, with the, the beluga sturgeon as a major part of their, of their history. You look under the bridges in Budapest and you can see sculptures that are, are hundreds of years old, sort of dealing with and, and looking at the art of, of Huso Huso, which is the beluga sturgeon. And then you have other species that are more local, that you know, live entirely within fresh water. They don't migrate back and down the river and, and, and lots of different variants within. And what, what's happened is over the past 100 years, uh, the sturgeon populations have declined drastically. And many of the reasons are the ones that, that we, can, we can think of. You have problems with overfishing. Mm -hmm. You have the problems with dams. Okay, so, oh, so, Tim, so, but in fishing, they're, they're fish for Caviar, what, are, what else are they used for? How are they used? Yeah. Well, um, st sturgeon are, are fished for, for many reasons historically, and uh, much like here, they were fished for, for meat, for, for, for sustenance. Uh, but more recently, what's happened is as the caviar market has really accelerated the price, um, you've had an increased um, pressure um, or opportunity, I guess, for poaching in the black market. Let me give you an example. The beluga sturgeon that I mentioned, the, the beluga caviar is the, the, the king of caviars. And on the black market, uh, you might be able to get 10 to 12,000 euros per kilo. Wow. Now, 12,000 euros per kilo, one of these big sturgeons might produce 20 to up to 40 kilos mm. of caviar. So suddenly, a, a, a poor fisher person from the Danube Delta lands a big sturgeon and suddenly you're looking at a half a million euros potentially which is, is a significant um, yeah. incentive and so the risk between sort of illegal poaching and and the 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 social and economic issues is is really really difficult now that's not to say that poaching and over harvest is the the primary reason because that, when you, you couple that with issues like loss of, of access to migratory uh, spawning areas, uh, there were some dams that were built. A uh, big one between, between Serbia and Romania was built during the communist era at Iron Gates. Um, that blocks their migration. So you have a loss of habitat, you have water pollution, you have uh, the, the illegal harvest. Uh, all of these kind of combine to create pressures that have really uh, cause the decline of these, these native fish populations. So the decline, we can, we can document what's responsible for the decline, right. but there, there's a, a hysteresis involved here because just because of the decline, just removing the causes of the decline is not necessarily going to restore the species because you have to deal with so many more complex 
social pressures, uh, economic pressures, and institutional issues uh, right now, especially now in southeastern Europe because of its geopolitical position. The Danube now is a major transportation corridor. Romania is the eastern end of the European Union, and the port at Constanza on the Black Sea is a major shipping port. When you go there now, it's filled with container ships coming from China and the east, and those container ships now are transporting goods on barges up the Danube River to Western Europe. Oil pipelines coming from Georgia and across the Ukraine uh, and the Black Sea now from Turkey, these oil pipelines and gas pipelines are a major source of energy that again go up the Danube Basin. So the Danube River now has many functions, one of which is fish migration, but migration of goods and services in the economic system. So the, the complexity of that is is really at in in many cases at the at the forefront of of restoring the sturgeon. And, and how many countries are we talking about now that that are that are um, along the the Danube? So I imagine all these issues, whether you're moving you're removing obstacles or you're you're um, trying to promote trade or or uh, energy links. It's not just as simple as one country deciding to, to do something here. No, no, you have, you kind of divide the Danube into sort of three regions. You have the lower Danube, where you have countries like um, Ukraine and Romania right at the mouth. Uh, you have Bulgaria and Serbia sort of inland a little bit on the Danube. So though they kind of form the, the core of the lower Danube. Then when you move above what's called the Iron Gates Dam, you get into countries like Croatia, Hungary, Austria, Slovakia, and that provides a middle region as well. And then you get into the upper Danube, which is you know, Germany and many of the other countries up there. And, and these countries have all been differentially impacted during the communist time. So they have different institutional issues that they have to deal with. Certainly Romania and Bulgaria, uh, Romania and Bulgaria, uh, Ukraine, much more integrated into the old Soviet bloc. Uh, you get up to Hungary and the Czech Republic, they were a little bit more, um, some of their institutions did not suffer as much during the communist times, and then you get into Western Europe. So you have this, this sort of gradient of, of social and political issues. So the, the real challenge becomes getting the, the, the scientists and the politicians and the economic drivers within these different countries to be able to work together. And that, that's one of the, uh, the goals of the projects that are being developed there right now, using sturgeon as, as a major flagship species. And, so, but, and what's the advantage of, of it being sturgeon? I imagine you could take, there are a number of issues that affect the entire Danube and affect all of those countries. Yeah. What's the significance of, of, of sturgeon? Well, you can answer that on, on three levels. I guess the first place to start is it's, it's what you can think of as a charismatic megafauna. It's, it's a big species, it lives long. It, it's, it's like the dinosaur 240 million years ago. They live to 150, 200 years mm -hmm. old. So it captures people's imaginations. It's been around a long time. So it kind of connects with people in, 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 in a cultural and almost spiritual sort of way. And that's the same in Romania as it is here in, in the Great Lakes. For the same reason that sturgeon is becoming that flagship species in the Great Lakes, it has become a flagship species in Eastern Europe and, and throughout the Danube. And that's why the Danube parks, which are 12 natural areas in the European Union, have chosen the sturgeon species as their, their flagship for sort of motivating the restoration and the rehabilitation of the Danube River. From a biological standpoint, it's extremely important because it provides the great sort of canary in the coal mine. They're, they're a great indicator. They integrate the, the water quality. They integrate the ecological system. They integrate so many of the stresses that we have to deal with in ecological restoration. So they're, they're good from a, a basic scientific standpoint. If you want to study contaminant accumulation from, from toxins and, and toxics, well, sturgeon Minus is a great, it's a great take some tissue stir from sturgeons <laughs> yeah. and you can, yeah. you can look at, at, at really as a surrogate for what humans might be exposed to. Uh, from a third standpoint, they, they do also connect with some of the social problems that are going on in, 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 in this region. Um, let me get back to the issue of poaching. Um, part of the reason that there's pressure for illegal harvest is that there are not 
many other economic alternatives in the Lower Danube. So you, you have poverty, you have lack of, of opportunities, you have families that live in the Danube Delta that have been fishing for, for hundreds if not thousands of years. And suddenly now you have the international community saying, well, you can't fish sturgeon yeah. anymore. Right. Well, they've been doing it for, for however long. And then you have the sturgeon populations declining, and you have the, the, the people in, you know, outside pointing fingers and saying, you know, bad, bad people right. in, in Romania for, for harvesting these. But, but they don't understand that, that the, the pressures that exist upon, let's say, a family who's looking for opportunity for their children it might be it might be right. irresistible. Let's um, we're just about at our break, and I want to I want to kind of continue back on the the sort of significance of, of sturgeon because a lot of the issues you mentioned in terms of the mm. the importance to, to to local peoples, you know, we know here in in Wisconsin as well. Mm. So we'll be back in just a moment on international focus. The Institute of World Affairs presents our community with a range of public programs relating to global issues, U.S. foreign policy, and the world economy. For more information about the Institute of World Affairs, call 414-229-3220 or visit our website at www.iwa.uwm.edu. Welcome back to International Focus. We're talking about bringing the sturgeon back to the Danube River, river with, with biologist and professor of UW, at UWM, uh, Tim Ellinger. And Tim, just before the break, we were talking about the significance of the sturgeon, and um, you, you were really focusing on the, the economic impact. And as you, I think you said earlier, uh, the caviar from a, one beluga could net Half a million half a euros? Million, oh, half a million dollars for, yeah. And this is in an area where, you know, you would have relatively economically depressed. Oh, yeah. There, there, are, there are stories of it's, it's like winning the lottery for, for some of the people there, potentially. Um, so, so then what other, you, mentioned, you talked about them as a, as a sort of flagship species. What's the sort of cultural significance of, of, of the yeah, sturgeon. Yeah, and, and you, can, you can think of it in terms of sort of the long-term history. Um, it was fascinating for me on my last visit to uh, the Danube Delta, going through a museum and seeing uh, stones from Neolithic times, 9,000-year-old stones that were used as weights by the people back then to actually sink nets that they would use for catching sturgeon. Mm -hmm. So as humans have been sort of coexisting with the sturgeon for almost 10,000 years or, or longer, perhaps. And <clears throat> from the standpoint of, of the fact that they, they have migrated up and down through the river, they provide a, a sort of longitudinal connection among the different cultures from the, the Romanians and the Slavics up through the Hungarians and the Germanic peoples. And, and now, because they are this, this, this flagship, they provide the, the thread that can get the people to agree hmm. from these different countries to get around a table and say, okay, what, what can we do to, to save the sturgeon? So is this, is this sort of one of those issues where, where people can say, hey, you know, let's, let's put our other differences aside. We can come together for the sake of the sturgeon. Is it that kind of a motivating factor? I think that's the idea. Now, whether or not it works or not, we still have yet to be seen. But, but certainly at the stage where we are right now, you have you have the politicians agreeing in principle and, and, and preparing sort of position papers that's saying, yes, we agree that we're going to, to work together to, to restore the sturgeon. And funding is available to bring the scientists together, like myself, with the, the people there and put together uh, operationalization plans. Uh, what, what projects do we need to do? What data do we need to collect? So there's the, the, the political will and the funding to start cooperating on gathering the information necessary. The, the difficulty is that it's easier to get people to agree on issues related to the biophysical environment, the, 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 the natural sciences mm -hmm. things. But when we start getting into the areas of, of the social and the economic impacts and start talking about, okay, what, what do we do at these dams if we have to start limiting the way that hydropower is generated or limiting the ways that ships can move back and forth through the, the locks, um, then it becomes, uh, becomes much more, more of, a, of a conflict. 
So we, we were talking earlier that, that we have all this complexity, right? We have complexity borne by, or, or because we have different countries involved, which have all mm -hmm. different internal dynamics. Complexity that comes because you have all these different uh, uh, intertwined factors, the social, the cultural, the political, the economic, and the scientific. Mm -hmm. um, where, where are you hoping um, this effort may go? And I, and I, and I guess I particularly want to focus on the issue of how, how do they make these social trade-offs? Mm -hmm. I mean, at some point, you know, you're, the, the scientific versus the economic versus the social culture, there's going to be some, some conflicts and, and how, how you yeah, work through those. Yeah, and it, and it is. And, and, and I kind of start by saying that the way to approach this is, is putting together truly interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary teams. So the, the people that I work with, for example, we have historians and sociologists that look at how cultural values are formed, how cultural values evolve over time, because dealing with some of the system is really going to be cultural transformation. You know, whereas thousands of years ago the, the sturgeon was sort of a central of cultural values, now it's going to take some time and some re, I don't want to say education, but uh, sort of a reformulation of, of how we value the sturgeon that's going to determine whether or not we make the investments now to make it happen. Now let me give you a really good example from just up the river here. Right now what's going on in Grafton. Mm. Uh, many people who really want to see the sturgeon restored have uh, submitted grants and gotten designs done. UWM was part of formulating a design to create fish passage around a dam up there. Uh, at which point the DNR said that this is going to be a problem because we have invasive species, we've, we've dealt, we've got all of these fish diseases that have come in. We can't let fish freely migrate up because you're going to cause damage upstream. But at the same time, they said, but if you build this and you only allow sturgeon to go past, then we'll, we'll approve it. But sturgeon right now, they're restoring sturgeon in, in the Milwaukee River. They're just stocking them right now. It's going to be 30 years before those sturgeon mature because they don't start reproducing the females until they're 25 or 30 years old here. And it's going to be 25 years before you start seeing a benefit. So do we invest now hmm. in building the structure that's going to allow people 25 years from now to be able to see the benefits? So a lot of this is seeing those payoffs in a longer time frame, recognizing that the investments we make now in restoring a species like the sturgeon, we may not see them in our lifetime. It's going to be investment we make for our children and future generations. And this is one of the other reasons why I think that sturgeon is such a good flagship species, because it forces the, the people to who care about them to effectively communicate to the decision makers that we need to think longer term about the consequences of the investments we make today. And something you said earlier kind of comes, makes me come back to think about this issue in a place like Grafton, which, which you know, people are here, around here may be very mm -hmm. familiar with, which you said earlier that, that it wasn't as simple in the Danube case of just simply removing a dam or the iron gates. In other words, fixing, uh, getting rid of one of the blockages on the river, but that, that it was, it was going to take a lot of, a, a sort of a more kind of holistic approach. Um, are we doing that here in in, in Wisconsin? I mean, are we, are we taking that kind of an approach to, to an issue like the surgeon in the Milwaukee River? Um, there, are small, there are small steps being done, and, and in many ways we're further ahead in the Great Lakes because we're dealing with a much simpler system. We all speak the same language, we have the same federal laws that we're dealing with, and, and Canada is, is a good partner with us. Uh, in the United States, we're, we're further ahead because our, our U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative have done much more in terms of mapping where the problems are. Um, they've done a, a lot of work, for example, in the Wisconsin River and the Baraboo River with developing models for predicting if we remove this dam or if we increase passage here, what's the available habitat that will be made available. That, that type of habitat modeling uh, has not been done effectively in the Danube. However, that's one of the projects that I'm working on with a colleague from the University of Alaska right now to develop some modeling for that type of habitat work there. Uh, the other issues in terms of water pollution, and we call it here in the United States non-point pollution, agricultural runoff, uh, is, is we're, we're probably 20 years ahead in some ways here uh, because of the Clean Water Act and the investments made back in the 70s and 80s. Uh, 
Southeastern Europe is just at the beginning of implementing their water framework directive. So some of the water pollution issues are, are not necessarily more complicated, but are going to take some time to do as well over there. Uh, the third issue, as I mentioned, with, with illegal fishing and um, enforcing laws is, I don't want to say it's, it's necessarily easier here, but it's, it's a little less complicated because of issues related to corruption that, that are much more uh, extant in places like southeastern Europe than they are here in the United States. We're just we're just about we have about thirty seconds or so left. But so, what's your prognosis? Do you think do you say for for a place like the Danube? I'm I'm very hopeful. I'm I'm very hopeful for a number of reasons. Uh, partly because the 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 new generation that's that's moving into positions of authority um, are really waving the flag of of the of these types of species, these flagship species. They understand you know, that, that what's good for sturgeon is good for humans. What's good for economic development can be good for sturgeons. And that if we keep this as part of the decision process, if we always think about, okay, if we're going to do a project, how will this impact sturgeon? How will it impact the, the, the culture and the environment? Um, it's, it's just changing the way we think about the consequences of our decisions. This could be the fish that saved the Danube. Right? <laughs> to, uh, Professor Tim Ellinger at UWM, thank you very much. Yep. Yep. Uh, to our viewers the International Focus, we'll see you next week. For information about the Institute of World Affairs and its many programs, or to become a member of the Institute, call 414-229-3220 or visit us at our website, 